it going? Welcome. And、uh, I hope you had an incredible time so far in Toronto. It's amazing. This is the last day of the conference. I'm Dr. Brian Cromlett. I'll be the moderator, and I'm going to start with the first lecture of the day.、Um, for Health Conference, we're going to hear from founders and industry leaders, and we'll talk about how technology is really helping the medical community and the future of medicine. So, to get started,、um, I'm going to ask a question for everybody in the audience What is the best medicine? You don't have to answer. So, if we went back and, and asked people over the centuries, some people will tell us it was probably praying to the gods or magic. I'm from the United States in the 1800s. If you went to the Western United States, people might say it was whiskey. Could be, maybe not. But now, if you go to 2023 with the ad tech of tech and AI, a lot of people might say the best medicine is AI generated biologics, which can cost $40,000 to $50,000, largely synthetic with lots of scary side effects. I don't believe any of those are the best medicine. I've always been of the notion that the best medicine is our food. And there was a Greek doctor 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates, who said, Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And what we all know is that、um, more than 70 to 90%, depending on the chronic diseases, are caused by the environment, especially our diet. So Hippocrates was right. I'm going to ask another question. And I don't think you guys can see the slides. Maybe we can get the slides pulled up. Oh, you can see it. Okay. So these are my two cats, Elizabeth and Avery. And why is it that every time I take them yearly for their well visit, the first thing a veterinarian asks is, What are they eating? But I'm going to be 50 in October, and my internist has never once asked me what I eat. And the reason for that is because I was actually trained at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine as a pediatric oncologist. This is my book in 1996. It's actually three days I learned about human nutrition, 180 pages. For 13 total years, I learned all about drugs, drugs, and more drugs. So we actually are lacking completely in learning about the root causes of all diseases and also how to treat them. And so I've spent the past 30 plus years of my life actually working on ways to use botanicals to actually not treat diseases, but actually help us stay well and help promote health care and wellness. And so what I'm going to talk about、um, for the remainder of the talk is going to be this main mantra. And I think this is something you guys can take pictures. It's the two main things that really have impacted. My life, and it's that medicine has gone down a wrong path of treating symptoms and not causes, and for too often torments patients with expensive and synthetic treatments that actually can cause harm. I just talked about those biologics that can be 40 to 50,000. I was just down in Coral Gables at a dermatology center where we're setting up some clinical trials. They actually have a cream for if you have a little bit of psoriasis on your elbow, it has a black box warning. It can actually cause T cell lymphoma. Pretty scary. Just to get rid of a little rash, you're going to maybe get cancer later on. So these synthetics can actually cause harm. The real answer, I believe, and many others, lies at our feet and our fingertips. It's correct nutrition and plant based solutions. And by focusing, like I have, more on these plant based solutions, we can literally prolong lives, avoid misdiagnoses, increase the quality of life, and essentially live in far greater harmony with our environment rather than fighting a constant rear guard battle against it. And my journey into medicine wasn't something that I always thought I was going to go into. I was actually、um, really interested in playing soccer as a kid. And when I was in high school, I actually taught soccer at a local camp. But my whole career changed in 1989 when a really close friend of the family, Andy, who was like a brother to me, got a rare form of cancer. And after six months of treatment at University of Maryland School of Medicine, he actually passed away. I got to、um, visit him often during those six months, and I got to meet his doctors, and they were asking me what I wanted to do with my life. And I said, I want to play soccer. And they're like, really? It's 1980s America. You really think you can make a career out of that? Who knows? I'll never know the answer because I listened to them instead, and I'm glad I did. I'm not as hurt, probably. No knee issues, thank God. But、um, I wound up that summer, it was before my senior year of high school, working in the University of Maryland Cancer Labs. And something that always impacted me, I wanted to know why Andy died and why his treatments didn't work. So I always thought outside the box. And so my research for the next five years was looking at acute myelogenous leukemia and why people have multi drug resistance. And we actually did a lot of clinical trials. I was just in high school doing my first clinical trial, and we actually found ways to override drug resistance in leukemia patients. I was blessed in 1995. I was accepted to the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. I was born in Maryland, so it's right in my backyard. It was、um, absolutely amazing, and I was training to be a pediatric oncologist, a children's cancer doctor. In 1996, just to show my parents that I was still alive and doing well, and I wanted to make sure they were doing well, I went home for a visit. And sure enough, my dad was going to the restroom pretty often. I'm not going to show a visual, but I asked him not to flush the toilet. We had just learned about colorectal cancer the week prior. And when I looked into the bowl, he had all the telltale signs、um, bright red blood and little pieces of stool. 
I, he promised me that the next morning he was going to be going off to see his doctors, and I went back to school knowing I would probably get a pretty dreadful call. And I have two daughters. I tell them my cell phone wasn't what's in the back, a little iPhone. I had like a power pack with a battery. It was much bigger. I looked like a military person with those cell phones back in, you know, in 1995. It's changed a lot. Thanks to a lot of people here at this tech conference with innovation. But I got the call that afternoon. It was from a surgeon. He'd already seen four doctors. They diagnosed him with metastatic colorectal cancer. It was outside of his colon. And、um, it's still hard to say this, but they gave him less than a 1% chance of living out the year. And so I was absolutely pissed. I just lost my friend Andy. I was almost losing my father. And I thought, and it, it's a question I had that changed my whole career path. Do I want to just sit there and wait for people to get sick and then treat them? Or is there anything we can do to be proactive? You know, and can we actually promote health and wellness? So I went all around. There were hundreds of labs at Hopkins. I told you the story about this book. Everyone, except for three, were studying drugs, drugs, and more drugs. There were only three that were studying preventing cancer, and it was all based on this new molecule they had just discovered three years prior called glucoraphanin. It's a phytonutrient that's found in plants. It's a great health promoting phytonutrient, and it just showed that in animals you can actually prevent cancers in, in rodents,、uh, mice, and rats. And I was really interested. I had already done several clinical trials prior to getting the Hopkins, and I asked if they wanted to do. Collectively, some human studies.、Um, we got a $20 million support grant, and I actually joined a couple weeks later the MD PhD program. That's why I spent 13 years at Hopkins. And I got to participate in some of the greatest research looking at the first in human ways to take sulforaphane from broccoli and, and really do chemo prevention studies for breast cancer and at risk women. And we did some prostate work as well. It was an amazing time. The best part, though, this talk. Is these are my parents. I just talked to them this morning.、Um, we saved my dad's life, not only with traditional Western medicine,、uh, chemo radiation surgery for six months. We started them back then on broccoli sprouts. We didn't yet have a broccoli product in the mass market. We do now.、Um, and this is my mom, this is my entire family. My daughters are, are in the back. My mom and my dad both have colorectal cancer. So I'm one of those unlucky people that have the genetics that's not good. And so I spent 10 years of my life looking at genetics.、Um, when I was at Maryland, it used to take me two weeks to study a single gene. When I did my thesis work on prostate cancer, in two days I could look at 22,000 genes. I could look at all the mutations, whether the genes are up or down regulated. And so this has been an amazing thing. And the analogy I give is if you give a physician the ability to use genetics with their patients, they'll never not want to have genetics, that genetic blueprint. It's actually the whole foundation of why you're well or why you might get sick. And we can predict decades ahead of time based on your genetics what you're going to have. And you're not sitting ducks. We can absolutely do stuff to prevent or sometimes delay disease, and that's using these plant based phytonutrients. So, the analogy is if you have a pilot, I'm going to be、uh, flying home tomorrow to Baltimore. If you tell the、um, Air Canada pilot that we're going to take away his radar or her radar, they'll say, I'm not flying the plane. Same thing with physicians. Once you give them genetics, they never not want that tool. So it's pretty amazing. Now, I'm going to tell you another、um, interesting story, and then I'm going to wrap this up by telling you a little bit about a technology that we have developed at BioHarvest, where I'm the chief medical officer. So, about seven years ago now, there was a 43 year old who was very healthy. He had played soccer, lacrosse, ice hockey during grad school, was an avid cyclist as well, and he woke up with a tingling in his hands, and, and in his left hands, and numbness as well. So, Knowing with that symptom, you should usually go to a doctor. It could be a heart attack, but he was a physician scientist, and instead he waited a week. So, public service announcements don't do that. Go to your doctor right away. Call 911. It could have been a heart attack. It wasn't. So, he went to an orthopedic surgeon friend, and because of his background, a lot of concussions from the sports, they actually gave him a Medrol dose pack. I'm not、um, kind of putting down Western medicine, but it's what they typically do. They didn't go after the root cause, they went right to let's mask the symptoms. So, they gave a Medrol dose pack, a steroid. It didn't work. They gave him another m e d r o l dose pack, nothing happened. So then they started doing scans. They did an x ray, they saw that he had a herniated disc, and then they did an MRI. And what they found were five white matter lesions in the brain and one in the spinal cord. Back in that time, so this was seven years ago, the differential diagnosis was either ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, with a two to three year survival, or multiple sclerosis. So neither of them were very good. And so after six months of blood tests and spinal taps, they actually wound up a disease of exclusion. He didn't have ALS, thank God, but they had him diagnosed with MS. He started on these incredibly toxic drugs that actually suppress your entire B cells and T cells. These are major components of our immune system. He got very sick. As a physician and scientist, he went to lots of different conferences like this one, gave talks, and because of his immunosuppression, he was very vulnerable to getting sick. So he was always on antibiotics. 
But from the perspective of MS, he was actually getting better and better. Most MS patients, they'll start with a cognitive test. Within five to 10 years, they have a decline of at least 25%. Six years in, he was one of the only、um, patients at Hopkins that was getting better and better with his cognition. They also looked at his neuromuscular status. I didn't share that MS is the disease where overactive, hyperactive immune cells in our brain, they're called microglial cells, usually because of environmental triggers. That's the root cause of the environment, chemicals and maybe a bad diet. They trigger these immune cells to attack the insulin, or the insulin, they, to attack the insulation of our nerves, which is called myelin. And so this is a tech conference. Think of the insulation of a wire. You have to get electrons to an electronic component. If you chew up or hurt the insulation, you won't get the. The current, and you won't be able to use that appliance. In our body, when we have myelin that's destroyed, we can't get a, a nerve impulse, so from our brain, say, all the way down to our foot, so you have neuromuscular issues. And the crazy thing with him is, over the course of the seven years, he got better and better. He had no weaknesses, he was only getting stronger. He had a better diet, it was exercising the right way. I'm going to share with you who this person is, and I'm also going to tell you how they got better. And,、um, I thought it was back there. It's actually me. So I was the one who, for seven years of my life, I was misdiagnosed with MS. So, what I did, and it's kind of dumb, the solution was right in front of my face the whole time. I'm even on a board of a company that works in genetics, and I had my genetics done 10 years ago. So, I went to a functional integrative medicine conference eight months ago now. I'm talking to a dear friend, he's now my doctor, Dr. Eduardo Maristani. I had a whole team, Texas and Florida, and they were like, Brian, you don't have MS. It doesn't make any sense. We looked at my genes. I had a gene for nitric oxide synthase 2. Two mutations from my mom and my dad. I don't get enough oxygen to my brain, so it causes white matter lesions. It's the number one reason why people are misdiagnosed with MS. But then they thought about my lifestyle. I was in the Scouts. I always loved the outdoors. I have two daughters. We hike a lot. I cycle all the time. There, and then I had genes. I have immunoglobulins. I don't make enough of them, so I'm more prone to getting Lyme's and tick borne illnesses. So they tested that. I had Lyme's and Babesia. I probably had it for decades. I also had two genes. I can't get rid of mold. My prior job for 13 years, I was the medical director for another supplement company. The top floor, it would always rain and there would be water leaking. I could actually see mold in the ceiling tiles and always beg to get them replaced. So for 13 years, I was inundated with mold. Sure enough, I had sartrotoxin to other molds. Sartrotoxin is lethal. Thank goodness, I think because of the supplements I'm on, I kind of made it so I'm here to, alive and talking to you today. And then the final thing, I had a gene that I can't get rid of mercury. I did a lot of cancer research and research in my. My career so far, so we worked with a lot of bad chemicals. I had high levels of mercury. Any one of those seven can cause MS misdiagnoses. I had all seven. The good news is using plants based、um, solutions, I've actually completely reversed my diagnosis. I don't have MS. And even better, while we were getting rid of all that stuff, I had mono in high school. We got rid of Epstein Barr virus at the same time, again, using plants. Pretty unbelievable. I did not learn this when I was at Hopkins. It's like a whole new field of functional integrative medicine. So, the amazing thing and part of my journey has always been、um, you know, when I, I was very religious as a kid, and then when we lost Andy, I kind of didn't believe in God. But then there's so many things that happened in my life, like my dad you know, and my mom、um, impacting my career. I got back, back into being very spiritual. And the divine intervention is two of the 16 supplements I take today. And I don't just take, you don't just supplement to supplement, you have to do it based on genetics and your kind of personal story what you might be deficient in, what you might have, what you need to clear from your body, from the environment. Two of the 16 supplements I have that I take, actually, the first one, my wife's also a cancer researcher. We do talk about fun stuff. It's not always cancer research at the dinner table. I can just show you that.、Um, we actually created a product called Abmacol. It's what they prescribed for me to get rid of the environmental toxicants. So I just wasn't taking enough of it. And then this product here, Vinia, I was actually the chief medical officer for BioHarvest for four months. I was taking one a day. And then this is the second product that I needed to take. We make it. It's just incredible. You can't, you can't make that up. It's just. Almost unbelievable. So,、um, Vinia and Abmacar are, are two of my mainstays, and I take like glutathione, NAD, NAC, a whole bunch of other stuff. And after this talk, I can certainly teach you a little bit more. Now, I want to wrap this up about what bioharvest science is doing. We're really leading the way in terms of agricultural technology.、Um, I was at the plant last summer. We're located in Rehovot, Israel, is our main production facility. This might cause PTSD in some of you. I'm gonna, I, my cats aren't here. They said if I use this little red thing and the cats were here, they would go crazy. But you see this little bottom right. You can see the petri dishes. So, just like high school biology or college biology, we start with plant cells and then we grow them and we propagate them and then we put them into larger and larger. We call them bioreactors. It's actually based on technology created by Dr. Yoki Hagai and Zaki Rakib.、Uh, this is a tech conference. So, Zaki is well known in this community. He actually was one of the co founders and co inventors of the broadband modem. And when he sold that technology, he made lots of money and was able to put together a big team of scientists and figure out how can we help health and wellness around the world. So, he developed BioHarvest 12 years ago. There's over $60 million in investment now into this biotech. 
we actually can grow plants in these bioreactors indoors. It's amazing. You go, it's like a, almost a sci-fi movie. There's like bioreactors all different sizes. Some are taller than me, and there's dozens of them with different cycles. In 21 days, we can propagate lots of kilograms of powder material that we can put into. Right now, we have a capsule. We just had a public announcement. We're going to be making sports bars and drinks and all kinds of other indications to get this material in there. The amazing thing about this is it contains these phytonutrients, what I've been studying my whole life, just hundreds of them in just this great product, quercetin, tannins, anthocyanins. And what I do behind the scenes is I test. I just came back from the Philippines and South Korea. We're doing a glioblastoma study in four countries. It's one of the most lethal forms of brain cancer. In South Korea, we just finished a eczema, psoriasis, ectopic dermatitis. Instead of people thinking they might get cancer, like I shared in the beginning, T-cell lymphoma, we can actually give this product and products like it and actually give them real results without all the uh, you know, unneeded side effects. So we back them with clinical trials. And then the final thing is we actually are working now with olives as well. We have actually olive extracts, and we're actually going to be doing also pomegranates in the near future. So I know that was a quick whirlwind tour going from a personal story to real hope now in this medical community. And I think the main lesson is, is we can actually flip around now sick care and turn it back to health care, just like Hippocrates has shared over 2,000 years ago. So let food be thy medicine, and at BioHarvest, we're really bringing the power of the plant to the people. So with that, I'm going to go and introduce the next two speakers. I think you're going to really enjoy them. And I don't want to mess up the name here, so... And, and the uh, topic is going to be the future of LGBTQ care. Uh, so negative experiences and fear of discrimination are a barrier for the LGBTQ community. Our next speakers will give us insights into how healthcare can be made safer and more inclusive for the LGBTQ community. So let's give a big round of applause for both Liana and Julia, and they're going to be speaking to us on this topic. So welcome.